Praise the Lord, brothers and sisters. I hope you're doing well today. Um, of course, today in our daily Bible reading, we have already read through the book of Acts and Romans. And uh, we started uh, on Saturday, uh, the book of 1 Corinthians. A very practical book, I believe, just very straight to the forward, straight to the point. Uh, it's one of those books I believe that is easily understood. Um, of course, the backstory to it was that Paul wrote to speak to specific issues, um, several questions that were uh, put to him by members there at the church, as well as just some very important areas that he wanted to uh, convey to the brethren so that they could live an effective life. Uh, this particular church of Corinth, uh, Paul started ministry in that area uh, of Corinth in Acts chapter 18, he spent just over a year there. And while he was there under God, he was able to just raise uh, this particular church. Of course, they would have had uh, different leaders over time, but Paul spent so much time just laying the platform, the foundation to ensure um, that these believers were grounded in the word of God. So, of course, the apostleship or the authorship of this particular book is the Apostle Paul. Um, the city of Corinth was a Roman colony located, of course, there in the area of Corinth. And this was on the principal east-west trade route of the Roman Empire. Uh, the commerce of the world flowed through the natural harbors of Corinth. The city was destroyed by the Romans in 146 BC, but had been built on pure white marble by Julius Caesar 100 years later. One of the dynamics uh, about this particular book, um, the city of Corinth is, itself was that it was a cosmopolitan um, society. That is, it was a trade route. And in the then known world, much of shipping cargo, the taking cargo from one area to the next, uh, certainly for that particular region would have traveled through Corinth. And as a result of that, what you'd have had, you'd have had just many different persons of different ethnic backgrounds, different cultural backgrounds, uh, people who worship different gods. And so all of that uh, was melting together in the city of Corinth. It was a city that was uh, was predominantly evil, of course, uh, but then the gospel came and many, as a result of that, uh, were saved. Uh, so there were several things that uh, we could perhaps even consider this morning, but the intent is just to look at, in a broad sense, what was transpiring there and also to reflect on uh, the four first chapters um, for First Corinthians, since we're at chapter four today. So let me tell you a little bit about just uh, what was happening in this particular area. As I said earlier, it was an area that was cosmopolitan. Um, all different kinds of lifestyles came together. And of course, it doesn't matter who you are, in any city you are and you have people coming from that city to salvation, then their previous lifestyle, their cultural background, um, the belief systems that they would have embraced over so many years, they are going to take that to church. Uh, we don't just take our bad habits with us and then leave it at the door and then enter into the building. We're going to take it in. And so it was a fairly young church. And so Paul had to spend a, spend a lot of time just trying to correct behaviors um, through the word of God. He dealt in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the first couple of chapters. He's talking here about this whole matter um, of unity or the lack thereof, disunity. Uh, they were a very gifted church. He commented that. Uh, in verse 5, that in everything ye are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge. 
this particular church had all the gifts in operation, but they had great problems. They had serious problems there. And as we read through of this particular book, we will be able to identify uh, much of the problems that we would have seen there. So let, let's take one of the first instances. And, and, and you see that in chapter one, in, in verse number 10, no, I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto me by my brethren, it, sorry, unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. So the household of Chloe uh, wrote to Paul identifying just some of the areas of contentions that existed in the church. Paul's response to this, now this I say that every one of you saith, I am of Paul and I'm of Apollos and I'm of Cephas and I'm of Christ. So one of the challenges that they had, they had favorites. Now these all represented uh, certainly Apollos and Cephas and Paul represented leadership, God, the leadership that God gave them. But they were so carnal, the Corinthian church, extremely carnal they were, and they were saved, but they were carnal. And so their problem was they begin to identify with personality. So one was saying, oh no, uh, I, am of, I, am, I am a follower of, of Paul. And others were saying, oh, no, 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 I don't like Paul too much. I prefer Apollos. Others said, oh, no, I am of Cephas. And then there were others said, no, 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 I am for none of them. I'm a follower of Christ. Um, how immature they were. And that was what Paul was driving at, that uh, they needed to understand that it was not about the individual it was about God that was working through them. And as you go throughout the chapters, he had to say, listen, Paul is nothing. Apollos is nothing. He said, one plants, that's Paul. Apollos watered. But then the increase really comes from God. So the one who plants and the one who waters, they are the same. They are laborers together with Christ and so he wanted them to break up that kind of a competitive kind of spirit that existed there because can you just imagine in a church service what to transpire if your favorite is not preaching the one that you prefer is not the one exhorting how are you what is your attitude towards the word of God think about us today when our favorite singer is not singing how do we respond in that moment of praise and worship? Are we focusing on our great God or are we focusing on personalities? And I think that's one of the tragedies of the church today where there are too many of us who are fixated on personalities, individuals. The truth is we are nothing. The point Paul was making was I, Paul, am nothing. Apollos is nothing. One person said, listen, I am nothing and you are nothing. But Jesus Christ is everything. And when we begin to see it as it is, then we begin to understand that all these persons are really ministers, servants. We as leaders are set aside to serve the body for the benefit of the body. And so let us begin to celebrate the the differences that we have, we, we've got. We have been blessed with. There are personalities in every church and they are, you know, hyped and jovial and, and, and we must celebrate them. And then there are others who their style of presentation might not is not the same. And we have to learn to appreciate them too because all of the giftings and all of the abilities that is resident in the church is given to us by God. It is for our benefit. And so I don't want to, you know, block my, my ears, stop my ears, because Paul is not my guy, but Apollos is. And I don't want to do the reversal either. 
I, I want to be blessed by all the different ministries and personalities that God has placed in the body for the edification of the body. And so Paul wanted them to really understand, to grow up from that kind of an ideology. We are absolutely nothing. And he spoke about himself in chapter two a little bit. I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And as preachers and teachers, we have an awesome responsibility to ensure that those that we seek to minister to, that the foundation that they are building on is not ours, it's God's, it's, it's not our giftedness and our uniqueness and, and our style and, and methods of presentation. But their faith, as Paul says here, must be rested, secured in Jesus Christ. Because when somebody is building on that certain, that sure foundation, Jesus Christ, then there is going to be no failure. Nothing will be able to destroy that person's faith. So Paul said, when I came, I didn't try to be somebody that I was not. I came to minister under the unction and the power of the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so I want to encourage all of us. I want to encourage us this morning that as we just connect with each other and as we gather together for worship and as we, our outlook must be one that, you know, this is all about Jesus Christ. Abilities and differences of presentations and, and all of that stuff, it is about Jesus Christ and it is for our benefit, the benefit of the church. And so he spoke to them uh, just quite profoundly um, that the focus must be Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. In, in chapter three, he identified uh, just the root of the problem their unwillingness to grow from where they were or they were not growing as they ought to let me let me say it that way not that there was no growth for there was growth but the growth that they had was not comparative to where they should have been by then so he said in, in chapter three and i brethren could not speak unto you as unto spiritual but as unto carnal even as unto babes in Christ. This was some time since the church started there. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. And, and, and what he uses to identify their immaturity and their carnality is, is here in, in, in chapter 3, verse 3. For you are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envy and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? So the whole matter of carnality is not that they were baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost. They were. He's writing to the church. They're at Corinth. But the problem he was having with them was that they had not evolved from that state of being a child into an adult. They weren't maturing. They were fixated on, on lusting after things that weren't theirs. They, they were striving. They were divided. They were walking as though they walked before. In other words, uh, they were using just their own, their old style of, of, of looking at situations and dealing with situations and they were not embracing this new life that God had called them to to give soft answer so that the wrath would be turned away to love when when love is not reciprocated they were walking according to the old order and not according to the new order that God had instituted for them they were walking as carnal unconverted men 
they were celebrating, they were speaking in tongues, they had miracles, but they were carnal. And you and I must understand that our ability to speak in tongues and our ability to participate in miracles or to see miracles before our eyes is not necessarily an indication of maturity. Maturity is demonstrated in the ability of walking out truth. It is the ability to be in a tight space where you are pressured. You are faced with all kinds of challenges, but you are able to rise above that and know that God is in control and that you ought to be different and you manifest the difference that God has placed in your heart. So they weren't there. And he went again in, in verse four, for one said, I am of Paul and another, I am of Apollos. Are you not carnal? Who then is Paul? Who is Apollos? But ministers by whom he believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. And because it is God who gives the increase, then Paul and Apollos, who are they? They are just, again, laborers together with Christ. Now he that planted, verse 8, and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Verse 9, for we are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. We are the ones laboring, but you belong to God. You don't belong to Paul. You don't belong to Apollos. You don't belong to your pastor or your bishop. We belong to God. And all of these men and women that God has gifted the body with to serve the body is for our own benefit. And we need to see it as that. So our pastors and our bishops and all these leaders who serve us, we must see them as a blessing from God to us. They are not our lords. They are our servants. And we, in return, are their servants because we are laborers together. We are serving together. And of course, there are different levels of responsibility. But the point is, we must never get to a state where we begin to idolize men, begin to worship men, begin to focus on men as though they are our gods, when truly they are not. And that was the point, Paul, or one of the points that he wanted to raise there. Now, if you look, at verse number 21 of chapter 3. Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours. Again, the point Paul is making, no man should glory in men. And you and I must evaluate our own selves. Are there men that, and women that we are idolizing? If, if we are doing that, that's an abomination. Our responsibility is to worship one, Jesus Christ. We respect our leaders and we show them the, the greatest respect. Um, we submit to them as the word of God says, because in doing so, we are really submitting to God. Any leadership that God has placed in your life, whether it is the husband and the wife relationship, the Bible tells us that husband, love your wives. And so when I love my wife, I am glorifying God. I am in submission to the word of God. And when the Bible says, wife, you know, submit to your own husbands. It is also a worship. It's worship that you're given because you're obeying the word of God. So the point he was making in verse 21, no man ought to be glorified men. For all men are yours. He says there, all things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. And guess what? Look at verse 23. And ye are Christ's and Christ is God's. So we all belong to God. And um, he wanted them to move away from the rivalry because where there is this unity, there is going to be no fulfilling of purpose. Mission is not going to be realized when there is division. Where there is division, there's a scattering, not a coming together. And we, in our own homes, in our, the churches that we attend, and just the larger body of, 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 of the community, we have to assess to see whether or not 
we are involved in dividing. And, and we must not do that. We must seek to bring together, bring things together. We must seek to edify each other, to help each other, so that together we can be saved. Because the focus must never be the man. The focus must always be the other M, the mission. The focus should not be what is pleasurable for me. It should be the other P, what is purpose. And, and so I want to encourage us this morning as we reflect on um, these early chapters of 1 Corinthians chapter 1 through 4. We're in chapter 4 today. And the, the Bible says here in verse 1, let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ, servants of Christ. So when you assess us, Paul is saying to the brethren at Corinth, see us as who we are, ministers of Christ, stewards of the mysteries of God. We are stewards. We are not gods. We are not lords. We are stewards. The church doesn't belong to the pastor, the bishop, and to any organization, the church belongs to God. He is God for pastoral leadership and all of that? Of course he is. He is God for organizations? Of course he is. But it ought not to be to the exclusion of those who are outside of the organization or outside of the quote-unquote local church. Our responsibility, of course, is to preach this great message to all. And when they come in, to grow them up into disciples. And even while we're doing that, we must be engaged in the continuous preaching to those who are lost so that all men will hear and have an opportunity to be saved. So Paul says, we're all ministers, we're all servants, and we are the stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. So he's now talking about the importance of faithfulness, that as stewards, as leaders, as members of the body of Christ, as musicians and singers and whatever we do, whatever area we function in, we must recognize that God expects us to be faithful. If I'm a Sunday school teacher, if I'm an usher or a deacon or whatever I do for God in God's church, God expects me to be faithful. It is required in stewardship. And you know what stewardship is. It is taking care of other people's stuff. In this instance, it is working with God. God has given us gifts and abilities. God has called us to service. And God now expects us to serve faithfully because there's going to come a day when we're going to have to, you know, we're going to be assessed. We're going to have to give an account. And so we want to ensure that we do this. In verse 7 of chapter 4, for who make it thee to differ from one another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now, if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? So again, he's talking again as men, um, the things that we have received, somebody gave them to us. God gave them to us. They are not ours. We are really stewards of the mysteries of God. Wherever we serve, wherever we sit and provide leadership, we must always remember that it doesn't belong to us. The ministry that we serve in doesn't belong to us. And it doesn't matter how long we have been uh, the minister of kitchen affairs. It's not ours, it's God's. And there's just this tendency in human humanity. Once we are in a position for an extended time, we begin to think. If we're not careful, we begin to think that we are the owners of it. We are not owners of nothing. There's nothing that we are able to manifest or to exercise that really belongs to us. The verse actually says, there's nothing that we have that we didn't receive. And if it is that we received it, how can I not begin to pretend as though I own it? It is mine. It's not mine. I received it. It literally meant that it was given to me. And just as though it was given to me, it can be taken away from me. And so I must bring all of this to my worship, um, to my ministry, knowing that all things belong to God. I, I like how Paul in just, um, in the latter verses or um, the middle verses here of 1 Corinthians chapter four, 
um, let, let me read for you uh, from verse number nine. For I think that God had set forth the apostles last, as it were appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world, unto angels, unto men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honorable, but we are despised. Even unto this present hour, we both hunger and thirst, and are naked, and are buffeted, and have no certain dwelling place. And labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless. So he's contrasting his life, his life story. He's saying, I've had it. I've, I've been going through it for a very long time. And you are now reigning. And the under point he's making is the only reason why you have the liberty that you now have is because one, God gave it to you, but God used his servants to bring this great gospel message to you. Because you couldn't have heard it without a preacher, right? And how can the preacher go unless he be sent? So he said, you, you seem to be having it all together, but I'm going through the going through. And, and it's okay with me. He said, to this very hour, we, both, we, we hunger and thirst and are naked. We are beaten. And we, in, in verse number 11 at the end, we, we have no certain dwelling place. Paul is saying, like, I can't tell you where I'm going to sleep tomorrow night. We have no certain dwelling place. We're always moving, always going always giving and it's not a complaint it is rejoicing it is knowing that we're laboring together with god doing a good work if you look at verse number 12 and labor working with our own hands he said we are laboring we are working with our own hands to sustain ourselves and when we are evil spoken of when we are buffeted when we are hated reviled you know what we do maturity here in a friend when people say all kinds of evil against us and hate us for no reason, or because you are just living for God, how do we respond to that? He says it here in verse 12, being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we allow it. The Bible says we suffer it. We are persecuted and we take it as a good soldier. And in Timothy, he spoke about that. And your hardness as what? A good soldier. Come on, hardness is a part of it. Being buffeted is a part of it. Being persecuted is a part of it. And these are just some of the things that will demonstrate your maturity and mine. It is how I respond in the moment of pressure. Uh, it is how I respond to people who are hating me for, as far as I see, no reason. It is how I respond to people who don't like me? How do I treat those who I know don't like me? How do you treat them? That is going to determine where we are on the scale of, of maturity. Because if I'm going to hate you because you hate me, then what's the difference between you and I? If it is that you are not saved and I am saved and you hate me and I respond in kind, come on, isn't something wrong? Am I not like you? even though I may claim to be saved. And so Paul was just seeking to deal with that, that particular matter. Being defamed, we entreat. We didn't fight back. And he's going to go someplace with that. Those who defamed our character and said all kinds of things about us. How did we respond? Did we take them to court? No, we didn't. We, and we entreated. We we took it. We endured it. We are made as filth of the world. Filth. What do you do with filth? Flush it away. And he says that's how the world sees us. And, and that was why Paul and the others were able to just demonstrate um, this great power of God. Because to the world they were nothing and they didn't have a problem. They were not trying to cozy up with the world for the world to, to be comfortable in their presence. Come on. It cannot be that you are involved in relationships where around people 
who are unsaved, living ungodly lives, and something about our lifestyle don't challenge them. Come on. Sometimes without saying a word, somebody must come and begin to defend themselves. Are you saying something is wrong with me? Without you saying a word, just by living for God. So Paul says, we didn't fight back. We are the filth of the world. We are the offscoring of all things unto this day. Offscoring. And you think about what offscoring looks like. It's, it's like a, a bar of soap. And you're rubbing on your rag. And you see that sud. You know, and after a while, as you, you, what happens after a while? It evaporates and it's gone. Paul says that's how the world sees us. As offscoring. We're not important. We are not regarded to be anything. And when we are there, it is at that moment that God can pour in us. Because we're not seeking to please men. We're seeking to please God. We have to be God pleasers, not trying to please men. Because you and I know we'll never be able to do that anyway. 10 will be okay, and the next 10 will be hating us. And then we change for that 10, and they begin to love us. And the 10 that loved us before don't like a bone in us anymore. We, we don't have the capacity to please men. We just don't. And we shouldn't strive to do that. We should strive to be representatives, replicas of Jesus Christ. Then perhaps the last thought here in verse, uh, in chapter four, for today, if you look at verse number 15, verse 14, I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. So Paul said, I've said some hard things, or at least you might think that they are hard. And, and he seemed to be Talking outside of his nature, you know, he, he, because one of the things that the Corinthians said, you know what, his letters are rough, but when he comes in person, he's like, he's like this cool dude in a sense, he's not, that's their view of him. And so Paul is going back to just perhaps that he's saying, listen, I'm not trying to, to harm you, I'm writing, I'm not wanting to shame you. But as my beloved sons, I warn you, because that's the responsibility of the father. That's the, uh, the responsibility of the under shepherd. He sees the danger coming. He sees behaviors. He sees what is going to happen. And he warns. And he warns and he warns. And it might not be, the warning might not be comfortable for all people. But it is his responsibility to keep on warning. Because you and I as leaders, we can't make people to do the right thing, but we can warn them. We can encourage them. We can instruct them in righteousness. But then the ultimate decision of acceptance is going to be theirs. If you look at verse 15, for though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. So Paul says, remember, the Lord used me to lay the foundation there in Corinth and to seek to nurture a church, to grow a church to a particular point. There were others who came after who served and who provide nurturing. And we don't, for one moment, say that what they did wasn't important. But, but you must remember that you have many instructors, but there are not many fathers. Let me tell you what he's talking about. And an and instructor is somebody who from time to time will come along and will provide certain amount of guidance, certain amount of encouragement. But then they move on. And when they move on, that's it for them. They will come to your church and they'll preach a storm and they'll teach a powerful message. Well, then they go on because that's not where they're planted. They are an instructor. So it's not a bad thing. But Paul is saying, remember your roots. Remember your foundation. Remember the one who spends time pouring into you, your father, 
nurturing you. Because it doesn't matter where the father is, the daddy is always the daddy. The instructor will come and instruct passionately, but he goes on and instructs somewhere else. But the father will always be the father. So he's saying you have many instructors, but you don't have many fathers. And in the day that we're living in, there are many who will preach and teach. But sometimes there are some people who don't even have the heart for those that they teach. For some people, it's just a job. It's an opportunity. But a father is gonna stick with you. When you're in pain, and when you don't have the ability to, to do the things you used to, the instructor will just move on. But the father is gonna be there for you through thick and thin. Father is going to be there for you. And so that's the point he's saying. Listen, verse 16 Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. Follow me, he said. I'm not going to lead you astray. I have your best interest at heart. My number one objective, he's saying to the brethren in Corinth, is not just to, to win you and to say, okay, I won Corinth. No. My intention is to see you become a disciple, see you become a follower. Follow me as I follow Christ, so that on that great day, you will be saved. And so as we read through the great book of Corinthians, again, just very practical book, um, so much there to consider. I want to encourage all of us to, to read, to keep reading. Uh, Lord willing, tomorrow we are in chapter five, a uh, very explosive chapter. Um, this is a church with a lot of problems. Um, but they serve the great God. And as long as they're able, they're willing to submit to God and submit to the leadership that God gave them, then they will overcome and have good success. Um, so the Lord bless you, brothers and sisters. Uh, before we go, let's just pray together. Lord, we thank you this morning for the word. We thank you for this daily Bible reading that we're partaking of. We thank you for the many lessons that we personally can identify um, through these scriptures. We ask that you'd be with us today and help us that we would apply your truth to our lives. We pray for family members, every brother, every sister, every visitor, to your church there at Hollis, United Apostolic Church, the place that we come together as a family to worship you, to exalt you, to be empowered, to be encouraged. We pray that you will have your way in every single life. Help us, Lord God, as we seek to walk our truth today and to please you. Have your way in us and we commit ourselves into your hands and we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, God bless you. Have a great day in the Lord, and we look forward in seeing you this evening at 7 p.m. in the house of the Lord for prayer and Bible study. Take somebody with you. God bless you.